Good evening, everyone. On behalf of all the trustees, thank you very much for coming to this Honor Frost Foundation lecture being given by Dr. Claude Dumesseral, who is one of our trustees. Claude has been working on the epic site of Sidon since 1998, and her findings range from 3rd century BC to medieval times, so this is an incredible story. Her excavations are, after Beirut, only the second urban excavation in Lebanon, and the possibilities, as she says in her book, celebrating the first 15 years, and you will learn, are limitless. One of the most extraordinary things about Sidon is that part of the ancient city is incorporated into the urban landscape at the very center of the medieval city. And so that we can, in reality, walk up and down the streets of Canaanite and Phoenician Sidon. It's unbelievable that one can do that. Her task has been to work out, for the first time, an occupation sequence and reference material that cover the, ti the time from the beginning of the period through Roman times and up to the Crusaders. Her, story, her work tells the history of one of the most important Phoenician cities, about which her am amazing work continues to reveal more and more. Claude, now it's over to you, and thank you so much for what I know will be a wonderful revelation. Thank you very much, Alison. Um, before launching myself, good evening, everyone. And before launching myself into this lecture, I would like to express my gratitude to my fellow trustees for inviting me to speak here this evening and for their unwavering support for a project that is very dear to my heart, namely the Sidon excavation, which after 25 years is still ongoing, thanks to the Honor Frost Foundation but will slowly wind down after granting us an unequaled glimpse at the cultural and social environment of Levantine society in the Bronze and Iron Age. The Mediterranean has long captivated the attention of every scholarly branch of learning, including literature, not least of which is Homer's vividly portrayed adventure of Odysseus across the enigmatic wine dark sea. The importance of the region and its connection can be put into perspective by highlighting just one particular artifact in Homer's epic Iliad. I am referring to the silver mixing bowl, once offered by Achilles as a trophy in honor of his fallen comrade, Patroclus. Homer described it as a silver mixing bowl crafted with exquisite skill by Sidonian artisans and borne across the misty expanse of water by Phoenician seafaring traders. Thus, the city of Sidon, 30 kilometers south of the capital Beirut, clearly had early connections with Cretan and Greeks, a fact further reinforced by the Greek myth of Europa, the putative daughter of the king of Sidon. Europa was abducted by Zeus in the form of a bull and taken to Crete, where she gave birth to their son Minos, from whom the Minoan civilization derived its name. While mythology and single object hold their own special significance in filling out a historical narrative, the concrete evidence provided by archaeology surpasses them in the understanding of any given scenario, a fact that is particularly true in the relationship between Sidon and the Mediterranean. An accurate picture of the significance of the city-state in the affairs of the ancient world would remain unverified if based solely on historical sources. Archaeological evidence produces actual cultural material that projects a more convincing and complete depiction. 
This particular Sidonian adventure, as Alison just told you, started in 1998, thanks to Dr. John Curtis, then keeper in the Near Eastern Department at the British Museum, and his colleague, Carol Mendelssohn, and the Department of Antiquities of Lebanon, and its director, Dr. Camille Asma, who set in motion an excavation that began in the heart of the ancient port city of Sidon. The true extent and relevance of the city's history has been unveiled for the first time due to the continuity in stratigraphic levels, confirming Sidon's major role in the ancient world, and it has shed new light on the Canaanites and Phoenicians by fleshing out what has remained meager in terms of information on these intertwined peoples. Until now, the scarcity of information has been a major challenge in the study of Levantine archaeology. Two sites were opened, one within the walls of the medieval city called College Site, and the second about 500 meters south of it called Sandikli. Today, the historic urban center of the city continues to flourish and has maintained a certain charm through its narrow alleys and tiny shop fronts enclosed within the contour of the ancient walls. The boundary of this medieval metropolis is demarcated by two castles, the Saint Louis land castle and the Crusader sea castle, the latter erected between 1227 and 1228 on an isolated rocky promontory is linked by a sturdy stone bridge and still fully accessible. The core of the ancient city is enveloped by the medieval walled precinct and its bustling harbor. Substantial parts of the city medieval defense have survived in the southern part of College site. The wall consists of well-worn square sandstone blocks with a rubble core or backing, and in some cases with the addition of Roman columns strengthening or for strengthening or as a possible decorative feature. This style of construction is very similar to the walls of the sea castle, and it is likely that they are contemporary. These defenses seem to have been built in one phase. Semicircular projecting towers were uncovered that once protected the fortification and were probably spaced 55 meters apart. A remarkable discovery took place in the city's moat. And you can see it on your right-hand side. It's the circle in the middle of the moat. This discovery dates back to 1160, 1256 AD, the 13th century, during the era of King Louis IX of France, also known as Saint Louis, which we see here burying the dead in Sidon, in the hours of Saint Louis, which were incorporated in the hours of Jeanne d'Evreux, his great-granddaughter, and which are kept today in the Cloisters Collection in New York. A pit was found containing 25 male individuals who had met a violent end in battle, evidenced by the blunt force injuries to their skulls and other bones and the signs of partial incineration. Among the skeletal remains, European shoe buckles and a coin were unearthed. Researchers from the Wellcome Sanger Institute in Cambridge analyzed ancient DNA extracted from nine of the skeletons found in the moat. This pioneering genetic investigation of ancient human remains confirmed that these were indeed the remains of crusaders who had journeyed from Western Europe to the Near East, where they intermingled with and established families alongside the local population, ultimately perishing together in conflict. The findings published in the American Journal of Human Genetics corroborate that three of the individuals came from either Spain or Sardinia, while four 
were likely recruits from the Near East. Notably, two individuals displayed mixed genetic ancestry, indicating that their lineage was the produce of intermarriage between Crusaders and Near Easterners. Even though the Crusaders mixed with local people and recruited them to their cause, their genetic presence was short-lived. According to today's standards, a great city is defined by its growth and development. And 5,000 years ago, the same criteria shaped the city of Sidon, making it a central hub of commercial activity. Through its port, Sidon assumed a commanding role in the commercial relations of the Eastern Mediterranean and the wider regional economy. At the heart of this very successful emporium lies its harbor. Only a few harbors along the Levantine coast can claim to have natural shelter integrated in the town itself. But also, an offshore reef which provides additional anchorage for larger local vessels and visiting foreign ships. This offshore reef itself, sheltered by an island called Zire Island, was utilized as a deep water anchorage, acting as an outer harbor. In fair to moderate weather, large merchant vessels would load their goods out there with their cargoes ferried to and from the shorelines by lighters. A comprehensive set of harbor structures, including seawalls, quays, and mooring bits, were constructed into quaternary sandstone, making Zire an essential component of Sidon's port system. In 2017 and 2018, a marine geoarchaeological geo survey sponsored by uh, the Honor Frost Foundation was conducted in the coastal zone of Sidon by Professor George Papadeodoro and his team from the University of Patras in Greece. And you can see on these maps the survey track lines around the island of Zire, as well as in the northern harbor and the southern bay, making Sidon one of the most closely studied of ancient Mediterranean harbor sites. Somewhere around the fourth millennium BC, the first people of Sidon chose a place called Dakeman to build their roundhouses, which is about one kilometer to the south from the current excavation site. Dakeman was a village that never transformed into a proper urban installation. On the contrary, the area was abandoned and used in the second millennium as a burial discovery, as a burial site, sorry. Our discoveries on bedrock gave a pottery sequence which appears to show that the people that abandoned Nakaman moved to the Tel area, the site of the current excavation. And this is surely explained by the fact that the location they moved to is much closer to Sidon's harbor and might just point to the beginning of commercial activity. Dakerman did not have a natural protected harbor, which explains why the base adjacent to it was never used as a port. Fifteen core samples carried out with the help of the University of Aix-en-Provence were drilled around the northern harbor near Sidon's Old Souk, as well as around the southern bay north of Dakerman. The samples confirmed that the Dakeman Bay was never used as a port. The background to this core sampling lies with Honor Frost herself, who carefully planned the first core taken in Sidon, and who meticulously instructed me on how to go about it. This was the first time any cores of this nature and purpose were undertaken in the Lebanon. An important added benefit from the result of the cause was the ability to reconstruct the 6,000-year evolution in the maritime facade of the ancient city. And this will go hand in hand with the results of the University of Patras. 
It is not a coincidence that the jaw with a maritime religious seal impression was discovered in Sidon. The seal exhibits a unique imprint of a ship accompanied by the Leonine dragon Ushumgal, the attendant of the storm god Adad, the overlord of the sea and patron of sailors. Strikingly, there are similarities between this seal and one found in Tel Dabha in the Nile Delta, as both depict the same ship design and the same theme of the weather god placed adjacent to a ship. Unlike the people of Tel Dabha who chose a striding storm god, the Sidonians selected a non-human form of the god to represent this fundamental ancient mythical perception of the Mesopotamian weather god. In both centers, Middle Bronze Age Sidon and Tel Dabha, two, close, two closely connected partners in maritime trade, this commitment to the sacred protection of their seafaring citizens was expressed using the same motifs. Evidence of settlement in Sidon in the third millennium BC shows the rise of a social elite attested to by a major transformation in household architectural organization. More than 165 kilograms of barley were found in the storeroom of a building that had completely burned down. It is thought for many reasons that the building was used for a much wider purpose than just a common um, everyday house, signifying the existence of a non-domestic edifice for a non-domestic purpose. Meanwhile, the earliest recognizable trade relationships between Sidon and Egypt are demonstrated from the origin of certain burial gifts in graves found in Egypt. These consisted of large vessels of Sidonian origin used as containers, sorry, here we go, for perishable goods. Um, uh, some context can also be seen with the Aegean world. It is also suggested by containers owing to the decoration of incised running or interlocked spiral motif. In the early second millennium BC, Egypt was Sidon's first and main economic partner. The most direct sailing route from the shores of what is now modern Lebanon to the eastern delta would likely have taken a maximum of two to five days. Ships probably sailing in flotillas to and from Egypt and contain mixed cargoes of raw materials, finished products and people are recorded in the Midrahina text. These are inscribed granite blocks found at Midrahina and are a unique source of information from around 1860 BC. They derive from the court records of Amenemat II, which describe various activities during two years of his reign. This text is considered to be the oldest and most detailed bill of lading or cargo manifest from the Mediterranean world. It features list of tribute goods sent from ancient Lebanon. Of course, not every ship carried ceramics, but it is reasonable to assume that most of them did. Pottery is currently the only medium whose geographical origin can be pinpointed with some precision, namely through style and chemical analysis. It is therefore instrumental in charting specific regions participating in the networks through which important merchandise was mobilized and in substantiating the intensity of contacts between these regions. Sidon's excavation yielded the largest collection so far 
of Egyptian pottery imported to the Levantine region during the Middle Bronze Age. While studies and percentages are still being assessed, it is clear that the corpus relates mostly to pottery of an average size, or average, um, average capacity of 10 to 45 liters, but also includes some over 100 liters, as well as smaller five liters capacity jugs. It should be noted at this stage that the increase of Sidon's Egyptian corpus from about 1860 onwards involved mainly vessels which were eminently suitable for the transport of commodities. The imports are solely represented by storage jars of various types and sizes produced in mal clays. This means that trade with Egypt was the cornerstone of a market for comestible goods that were needed by the Levantine population. And in the same way that this trade was reciprocal and equally essential to Egyptians, per year, an estimate average of 8,000 Canaanite jars containing olive oil and wine were shipped from the Levantine coast to Tel Daba in the Nile Delta. In return, Egypt manufactured a type of ovary jar with a corrugated, sorry, with a corrugated neck, you see it on the right hand side, in a size that was larger than the usual Egyptian model, specifically for export to Sidon in order to satisfy Sidonian demand. Pottery imported as receptacle of commodities is not the only potential marker between Sidon and Egypt. A selection of artifacts such as a seal and scarabs, uh, along with the illustration of images, also indicate deep religious and cultural connection. A scarab reed found in Middle Bronze Age Sidon, belonging to a Sidonian high-ranking individual and inscribed with the name Beloved of Set Baal, Lord of the land of Ei, confirms the existence in the Levant and outside of Byblos of a scribal tradition using Egyptian hieroglyphs. The fact that it takes the form of a scaraboid together with the form of the hieroglyphs themselves somehow is hesitant when compared to pharaonic documents of the same period corroborates a Levantine rather than an Egyptian origin to the seal. The early second millennium in Canaan also marks the beginning of a new urbanized society, an urban of international trade and cultural exchange. There existed an exchange of prestige goods between high dignitaries or city notables, an example of which is this Minoan cup, which judging by its shape and decoration comes from a workshop at Phaistos, one of the great centers of southern Crete, which commanded the plain of Messara. This prestigious artifact ended up being placed in a mortuary context. The cup, dated by carbon 14 to 1984, 1859 BC, is the earliest Minoan import found in the Levant to date, and thus precedes the Minoan imports found at Ashkelon, Hatzor, Beirut, Byblos, Ugari, and Katna. Gift giving stabilized relationships and even led to the deliberate imitation of a Cretan marine motifs of leaping dolphins on objects produced inside them. The reason for this is that exotic products conferred social advantages. This locally made jar is characterized by its bichrome decoration of plunging dolphins above stylized waves. The type of decoration is similar to the Pachyamos dolphins in Crete that also appears on jars and on the dolphin vase from El Licht in Egypt. Now, the export of silver from Sidon illustrates yet another complex level of exchanges which were in existence from as early as the second millennium BC. Silver jewelry was very common 
in burials inside them. These included a headband, a bracelet, an anklet, the remains of a bell, a minimum of 18 nails, two silver rings, etc., etc. Analysis of this silver indicated that the Ala Daglari range in the central Taurus Mountains are the most likely source for the silver found in Sidon's graves. The concentration of silver found on the Levantine coast has already been well attested to at Byblos, which played a central role in the silver trade with Anatolia from as early as the fourth millennium BC. An analysis carried out on the silver object found aboard the Uluburum shipwreck also turned out to be silver mined from the southern central part of the Taurus Mountains in southern Anatolia. International trade existed in the eastern Mediterranean basin as early as the end of the second of the third millennium BC, as we've just said, I've just seen. However, this practice did not evolve into a widespread mercantile system until the late Bronze Age, specifically during the second half of the second millennium BC. This period, known as the International Period is characterized by maritime trade that encompassed the entire Eastern Mediterranean. During the late Bronze Age, the development of maritime trade with its clear economic effect increased between the Lebanese coast and Cyprus, Crete, and Mycenaean Greece. Vassos Karageorgis, in his publication of the Aegean and Cypriot imports from Sidon, underlines the spectacular influence of Sidon, to Sidon of Aegean and Cypriot ceramics by the middle of the 13th century BC, whereas the ceramics suffer a decrease in Ugarit and Tel Abu Hawam, for example. More recently, the publication of the Mycenaean pottery from Sidon's underground temple, specifically room two, underlines the floor wheat of Mycenaean pottery to Sidon from as early as the 14th century BC, where most of the imports to Sidon came from the northeastern Peloponnese. The argument that most of the Mycenaean pottery found in the Levant was the result of trade controlled by the Cypriots has been contested, and proposal has been made that the Mycenaean themselves had direct trade relations with various sites in the Levant where they established trading partnerships. Evidence of strong links with Egypt during the late Bronze Age was found in Sidon with this imported Egyptian vessel decorated with a frieze of lotus petals. Painted cartouches bore the throne and birth name of Queen Tawasret. Tawasret, here she is, independent rule, was brief and appears to have lasted less than two years. As a consequence, this vessel can be dated with great precision to around 1190 BC, with a margin of error not exceeding 10 years at the utmost. The vessel is of a great importance as it provides major evidence that Egypt was still maintaining good relations with Sidon during the reign of Tawasret, and more importantly, that business was going on as usual at Sidon. That our threat vessel was not an item of trade, but a precious gift for ritual use for which Egyptian faience vessels were typically produced. Sidon's dominant position among the Phoenician coastal cities in the 12th and 11th century seems clear from the surviving historical record. The story of when Amun, a priest in the temple of Amon at Karna, who was sent to Byblos to purchase cedar wood. So he tells us that he stops at Dor, where he was robbed, and then he arrives at Byblos, where he received a hostile reception. This was the moment where Egypt was in decline. But what we know from this text is that around 1080 BC, the Sidonian king, Wakat Ili, boasted no less than 50 vessels assuring maritime traffic between Tanis in the Nile Delta and his hometown, whereas trade between Egypt and Byblos was transported by no more than 20 ships. 
At the end of the 13th, beginning of the 12th century, a temple was built inside them. This is a rare phenomenon for this time period because the 12th century Mediterranean horizon involved profound cultural and political changes, except for Phoenician sites. Inhabitants of these cities are referred to as Canaanites in the second millennium and Phoenicians in the Iron Age, illustrating the discontinuity and an arbitrary distinction between the Late Bronze and Iron Ages, a phenomenon not documented in Phoenicia, where there is a continuity of occupation. What is striking is the architectural continuity and the floors lying one on top of the other, thus creating a compelling case that the same people, well acquainted with this temple, rebuild it continuously to suit their needs keeping faithfully with the same scheme of tradition and thus reinforcing the perception of there being an incredible tenacity committed to this tradition. From the artifacts found in the Sidon Temple, it is clear that demand for luxury goods continues unhampered by regional events. This is the period when iron was used for the first time to manufacture tools and weapons, and that the luxury items such as ivory, like this ivory comb, or ivory furniture inlay, and artifacts such as an alabaster vase and an alabaster anointment spoon in the shape of a lotus were all special Egyptian imports. Regular trade between itinerant Phoenician merchant and the Aegean clientele in the first millennium, namely, as we said, the Iron Age, continued to expand. Greek merchant also visited Phoenicia, which accounts for the many finds of Euboean pottery, types the Skiphos, from Euboea or the northern Cyclades, used for drinking, with, and which, without doubt, are an expression of Sidonian preference. The excavation at Sidon brought to light 55 pieces of Greek geometric pottery that belonged to at least 30 individual vessels dating to the proto-geometric to late geometric one. But what is important, it is one of the largest assemblage of Greek geometric pottery that has ever been found along the Levantine coast. On the one hand, this is a significant find that provides new evidence about the social and cultural perception of Greek pottery in the Eastern Mediterranean. On the other hand, these pottery finds are particularly helpful in the ongoing discussion about the correlation of the regional pottery styles between the Aegean and the Eastern Mediterranean, as well as following the publication of 37C14, carbon-14 analysis from Sidon, for the achievement of a consensus on a reliable Mediterranean ceramic chronology. This crater, depicting the tree of life, flanked by two rampant goats, was found in Sidon. It is of Euboean origin. The motif of the tree of life is a ritual motif originating in the Eastern Mediterranean. The introduction of this particular motif flanked by two rampant goats was, in the Greek geometric iconography, attributed to the so-called Cisnola painter by Nicholas Goldstein. The Cisnola painter is well attested and so, and on a so-called Cisnola crater that was found in Corion in Cyprus in the early 1870s and which dates back to 870, 790 BC. It is now kept in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. The Sidon vessel is the only crater found to be comparable to the Metropolitan Museum vessel. This emblematic mixing vase was not randomly brought to Sidon and must have been exchanged and used locally as an artifact of symbolic value. Finally, in the fifth to fourth century BC, a large quantity of Attic pottery 
was also found inside them, and I'm just showing you a few. So, conclusion. The main network of maritime traffic with Sidon started in the early Bronze Age and developed as early as 1860 BC. While Cypriot and Aegean pottery have long been identified in the Sidon area, it is the recognition of Egyptian common wear that has been very important. Egypt was Sidon's first and main economic partner from as early as the beginning of the second millennium BC. Of course, fine wares from the Aegean and Cyprus also made their way on the city, to the city, but in much reduced numbers and usually as object of high value used for beverage or food consumption. Trade in the late Bronze Age, the second part of the second millennium BC, intensified and became more organized. Aegean material became accessible to all Levantine cities. Cypriot pottery also increased in quantity and was found wherever Greek imports were found. These imports had different networks of distribution within the Sidon region, thus suggesting that they were not the random acceptance of generic vessels, but that they were actually directly related to different market needs. For example, the majority of Mycenaean pottery from Sarepta, a site south of the site we are excavating, comprised closed forms, predominantly stirrup jar, which were most likely designed to carry perfumed oil or unguent oils. The fact that these vessels were also found on the site Dackerman Cemetery showed that they had a meaning beyond the functional. On the other hand, Sidon's elite chose exclusively to acquire open vessels linked to ceremonial and ritual activities used for feasting and libation. Thus, the Mycenaean influence was clearly detectable in the material concerning cult and banqueting. In itself, the Taos head vessel from Sidon is one of the first examples to illustrate the variety and different levels of exchanges that existed simultaneously in the late Bronze Age, and it also illustrates the impact of a gift sent from Egypt to Sidon to lubricate the wheels of diplomacy an aspect of international communication not directly linked to religion or trade. The first approach in identifying patterns of imports within the Sidonian sphere of influence is to illustrate a supply market ready to satisfy different demands. This highlights the huge potential of future research towards a regional approach to imports along the Levantine coast. From the 172 Sidon Canaanite graves of adults and children buried in, grave, in, buried in constructed graves and jars discovered on college site, scientists from the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute sequenced the complete genomes of Canaanite individuals who lived in Sidon during the Middle Bronze Age. They compared these genomes with those of other ancient and contemporary populations. The findings published in the American Journal of Human Genetics suggest, surprisingly, that present-day Lebanese people are direct descendants of these ancient Canaanites. Trade, exchange, and centuries of commercial activity in the region have always been considered Lebanon's natural element and the foundational basis of its existence. Sidon's revelations appears to be a powerful substantiation of this premise. Thank you.